Hello everybody and welcome to another episode of Games I've Wanted to Play, the series where I dig through the treasure trove of gaming's history to play through and review a game that I've always been keen on wanting to play. Today is Capcom's Onimusha Warlord, which sees you taking on the role of Samanusuke, a samurai who is summoned to the castle of his cousin, Princess Yuki, to find out what is behind a number of strange events. When he arrives, he finds the place is overrun by monsters. It turns out that Nobunaga Oda, who was thought dead, has struck a deal with demons known as Genma. But he needs to sacrifice the princess and an orphan that he's taken in in order to gain more strength. Naturally, it's down to Samanusuke to put a stop to this. Onimusha as a series was originally conceived as a sort of Sengoku Biohazard, that is to say a Resident Evil style game but set in the Sengoku era of Japan. It was to be set in a house filled with various traps, you'd fight with a sword and shurikens and make use of ninja techniques. Quite interestingly, the series was originally conceived for the ill-fated uh, 64 double D add-on for the N64. Now, the game itself actually did start development on the original PlayStation before moving across to the PlayStation 2. And when it initially released, it got widespread acclaim, with the PS2 version sitting on a nice 84% on Metacritic. It got an enhanced port for the Xbox, which sits at 81% and a lot of critics did agree that the graphics, sound and gameplay were all fantastic but with one criticism coming in for the game's length detracting from the experience. In more recent years it has received a HD re-release which unfortunately isn't quite as highly rated with the PC version sitting on a rather lowish 67% on Metacritic and the Switch, PS4 and Xbox One versions all hovering around the early 70s. But on its original release in 2001, the game was successful and it did spawn a whole franchise with Onimusha 2 Samurai's Destiny following in 2002. Onimusha 3 Demon Siege would come out in 2004. Um, all those three games coming in as part of one big planned trilogy for the series. There was a fourth game in the series released in 2006 called Onimusha Dawn of Dreams, which started a new plot, uh, new plot, plot line. Easy for me to say. So, why do I want to play this game? Well, I've already played it about 20 or so years ago, which uh, shows my age. Uh, it was during like, my last year of secondary school. I had a friend who loaned me it as he really liked it and thought I should give it a go. So I played it back then. Um, I remember one particular night he stayed over and we played through the entirety of the game and we did a similar thing for the second one. So really what this is about is about me revisiting this game and series, uh, finishing off the trilogy eventually and seeing how they all hold up. I also kind of wanted to revisit it because I think Onimusha is one of those cult series that people have a lot of fondness for. It sold well, it was critically acclaimed, but I don't know too many people really who have played it. But those who have played it have such a great fondness for it, who remember it as one of those games that they really, really loved. So I wanted to revisit it and see, you know, how much I enjoy it some 20 years on. So all of that said... What are my expectations for the game? Expectation wise, well, when I first tried this game back in about 2003-ish, I was a little bit wary because I wasn't great with horror games and admittedly, I'm still not great with horror games and there's a part of me that felt it was horror, it was Capcom, it felt very much like a Resident Evil game and of course in the previous section we mentioned it was conceived as a Sengoku era Resident Evil. Um, but playing it more back then with my friends showed me that it wasn't actually a horror game. It had supernatural elements, it had monsters, but it was quite a straightforward action, what we call like a hack and slash style game nowadays. So I'm not expecting anything scary from this, but I do remember it having a similar feel to some of those older Resident Evil games. Which means I'm expecting some tanky controls, I'm expecting some annoyance from the fixed camera angles that those older games were known for. Like I say, I remember it, war it did utilise that style. It was probably 
most made famous by Resident Evil back then, but a number of other games, especially horror games, made use of it. And because it's an older game, like I mentioned, those tank controls, I'm expecting a little bit of clunk. Maybe not like PS1 style, because this is a PS2 game, and I know it's got pretty good production values in Capcom. Even though they kept making use of tank controls, they tried to evolve them as it went on. I also am expecting a fairly shortish experience. The critical consensus seemed to be that it is a short game. And when my friend stayed over, we played through it in pretty much an entire night. Um, so I know it's not the longest of games. Um, but he had played it multiple times by at, back then. So maybe he knew exactly where to go and how to play it. Much like in the classic Resident Evil games, if you knew where you're going, you could probably complete them in about two hours if you skip the cutscenes. So let's go on and see how my first impressions were. The game starts with a seriously impressive cutscene showing the battle between Nobunaga's army and a rival clan. It culminates with Nobunaga's supposed death and the eventual writing of the letter from Princess Yuki to Samonosuke calling him to the castle, claiming that there's been these disappearances, she thinks there's monsters behind it and she wants Samonosuke to come and help to assist with that. Now, once this finishes, you find yourself in the castle grounds. You get a little bit of a taste of combat against some zombie-like creatures. This is sort of your cannon fodder throughout the game. You're very easy to fight creatures, and obviously as the game goes on, it will get tougher. But they're just, you know, it's a little bit of a taster. The first thing that really stands out to me is that Samonosuke actually moves a lot more fluidly to what I remember and maybe what I expected. I thought he was going to be a lot slower. I thought he was going to be a lot tankier. But he, he turns quickly, he moves quickly, he attacks quite fluidly. And it was quite nice to get used to. And whilst I didn't have any major issues at this stage, um, I would say my main point of concern was those fixed camera angles that I mentioned in my expectations. There were some angles and transitions that might throw out issues later on in the game. A few times... You can see how the transition might pop an enemy off screen so you're not aware of what they're about to do, what their position is. It also throws off your own sense of direction. You're moving forward, the camera transitions, so then you're thinking, oh, which is the forward direction? So as the game goes on, we defeat these cannon fodder type enemies. Samonosuke is soon defeated in battle by a, a larger enemy. He's whisked away to a strange realm where he's given a gauntlet that can absorb souls from fallen enemies before being sent back into the game. And this is kind of where it begins properly. You're armed with the gauntlet and you're introduced to the three different types of orb that float around after you defeat an enemy. Red depicts an experience orb, which you will use to upgrade your items. Blue restores your magic power, and yellow restores health. And it's not long after this you'll actually get your first sort of magic sword, which is infused with a lightning power. I was actually quite surprised by these earlier stages, and that's just how nice the game looks. I think this is a bit of a thing on my my end but i have a specific idea of how a ps2 era game looks and so when i go back to play them i'm often surprised at just how nice even the earlier games for the system look and onomusha is no exception to that secondly is the overall atmosphere of the game and capcom were always really good at creating an atmosphere especially through the resident evil games you can see that resident evil influence on it and much like that they've just made you know, it's got really nice attention to detail in the environment. The sound and music really helps set the scene. And the enemy design as well just fits in so well. So eventually you keep playing through it. You go through a few little scenes, start to fight some different forms of enemy. And you eventually build yourself up to fight this big boy from before the first major boss of the game. That, you know, smashed Samusuke into the ground um, before he got the gauntlet. It was actually a really fun fight. The camera angles and transitions did make things awkward at times, especially as you went in the corners of the arena, because I wasn't sure where the big boss was, what he was going to do. But he was relatively easy. He had a pretty predictable fight pattern, and I was able to topple him with no major issues. But overall, I've really enjoyed what I've played for these initial stages. You can, like I say, you can see the Resident Evil influence on it as you move through the maps. Um... And building up to that first boss, I felt like it was a nice gradual path. So, first impressions, very positive. Let's move on to the rest of the game. Right, 
So my first impressions were incredibly positive. I liked the taste of combat I got. I liked the lead up to the first boss. Even a little hint of puzzle um, I got an average I will cover later on. I really liked the atmosphere and enemy design. How did the rest of the game go? So it took me about four hours to get to the end of the game. I'm not sure if that game timer factors in cutscenes. But we come back to that point I've mentioned before. This is not the longest game you're going to play. I think if you're planning on playing through just the story of it. Then maybe if you get lost in the game. That four hours might stretch to about six or seven. But I don't think many people will have that sort of difficulty. And it won't take them long to get through if you're focusing just on story. If you're a completionist, then you have two things available to you. The first is the collectible fluorites, of which there are 20 scattered throughout the game world. Well, 17, but we'll get to that in a moment. And if you get all of them, that unlocks some additional costumes and mini games. So going back collecting them, maybe add another half hour, hour on, depending on how stuck you get. You do get an item which will highlight where they are, though, when you go past them. So, you know, that's adding a little bit of time on there. Secondly, you have the Dark Realm Arena, which has you going through 20 levels of an arena, taking on enemies of increasing difficulty. It's worth pointing out that if you want to get all 20 fluorites, you're going to have to do this anyway, because several of the fluorites, I think three of them, are rewards for finishing certain floors of the arena. So again, maybe you're adding another half hour to an hour on there, depending on how difficult you find it. So... Maybe if you get stuck, that six to seven hours could get pushed to nine to ten hours in total. But I do not think it's going to take many people that long. Now, in my first playthrough, I didn't bother collecting all the fluorites. I got about 11 to 12 of them. That was quite natural. And I did intend to take on the arena. But... I didn't realise that once you hit a certain point of the game, you were no longer able to go back and take on the arena. So that was my mistake. Um, I didn't know it was going to get locked off. But this feeds into another thing. If you complete the arena, it gives you access to the best weapon in the game. But I didn't have any difficulty with any of the bosses, including the final boss. I didn't need the best weapon in the game. So, length of the game... Not the longest game in the world. If you know where you're going, probably even less time. Difficulty, I played through it on the standard difficulty and I thought it was quite well balanced. Uh, no enemy ever really felt unfair. No bosses felt overly difficult either. There was certainly a knack to complete in some of them. One boss I did die on a couple of times, but that was down to my own lack of recognising what I had to do in that fight. Most of the others, I had no issues with whatsoever. And like I say, that is including the final boss. There were some frustrations from those fixed camera angles and transitions, which, like I mentioned, they'd occasionally frame the player and enemies in such a way that I had difficulty knowing where the enemies actually were. It wasn't overly common, but it did make an impact when it did happen. Again, there was one battle in particular where you fight three ogre-type enemies, including the bigger ogre. And if you go to a certain point in the map, it frames them all off screen and then sort of faces the player. So if you've lost track of them, they can do some serious damage. But then the second time around, I knew exactly what I was expecting from it. Uh, some of the other issues I had with combat was just down to me not knowing when to hit the enemy. Getting my timing wrong, maybe being a little bit impatient. Or there were some cases where you'd have ranged enemies who would attack you from up high. And they could, if you had your back turned to them, they'd hit you. And that could make you stumble into further attacks. But again, I think that's just knowing what to prioritise. And how to dodge and when the direction of blocking. It's not, like I say, it's not the most difficult things. It's just about learning and being patient. Something which, you know, the patience is something I do lack from time to time. Um, other little bugbear of the combat, this isn't tied into the difficulty as such, it's more the general gameplay, but it's weapon switching. Very minor issue, but if you want to change your weapon, say you're using the blue lightning weapon and you want to use the red fire weapon, or you want to use a ranged weapon, you have to go into the inventory menu to select your weapon. Which is, it takes time, um, 
I maybe it's not the it's not the biggest deal in the world, but they're not being a shortcut on it for a controller on the controller like you might have in modern games. It's just it takes like a little bit more time. It's a little bit of annoyance. I don't know of many games back from this particular era that had this real time weapon swap. In fact, was much hyped up in the uh, PS3 era. I might mention. Um, but I know Resident Evil always had swapping via the pause menu back in these days. So I think it's just a quirk of the tech at the time. Maybe there is a reason they couldn't do it. Um, but there is a spare weapon on the con a spare weapon on the controller, a spare button on the controller, which maybe would have been nice for using your ranged options rather than having to use, yeah, you know, having to select a ranged option in there. But like I keep reiterating. It's not a major issue. Now, tying in with the combat system, there's a small upgrade system in the game, which you will need to make use of. So I say small, it's actually quite a major factor. It's broken up into upgrading your weapon strength, the magic associated with it, and you can also upgrade some items, for example, herbs to medicine or arrows to fire arrows. At a base level, you will need to upgrade all of your magic to level 3 as some of the doors you come across are covered by these di these coloured orbs, and that dictates what magic level you need to dispel them. So you might come across a door with a singular red orb. That is fire magic level 1. You might see two blue orbs on there. Lightning magic level 2. Three green orbs. Wind magic level 3. You get the idea. If you're a little bit concerned about the aspect of it, don't be. The game has an abundance of enemies that do respawn as you come back through the rooms. So getting everything upgraded is not an issue. If you decide to tackle the arena, you'll probably have even less of a problem with it. By the end of the game, I had an abundance of experience orbs and nothing really to put them into. If we round out these uh, discussions about the gameplay, the game also has, quite nicely, an abundance of puzzles within it. These range from these trick boxes, which are kind of a sliding number puzzle that challenge you to line up a sequence of numbers in a set number of turns so you have like as an example one two three four five six all jumbled up and it might say get it in order in three turns there is a cipher like puzzle as well which i did like um which is a question of and working out the correct symbols based on text you've picked up so you're given like uh, what is the weapon that dispelled the demons and based on books you've picked up around the around thing you'll learn that it's the gauntlet of the augurs and you pick the symbols that match that in the text i thought that was quite a nicely designed puzzle but that might also require a bit of backtracking so those are a little bit optional but they do provide some nice rewards and in one part of the game there is a fairly lengthy sequence which is basically one puzzle after the other and i thought that was incredibly fun if not a little bit panicky, especially when it came to one particular sliding puzzle, because I've never really been great at sliding puzzles. Um, maybe the only negative with the puzzles is that those cipher-like ones, you find the boxes for them early on, but you won't be able to solve them until later. But if you're a completionist, you enjoy the exploring, that won't be an issue for you, and it gives you a reason to fully explore the game world. Now, as you've probably guessed from the length of the game, the map uh, you get to explore isn't massive, but exploring it in can be quite fun. You can get a little bit turned around from time to time, and there is quite a lot packed into its many rooms and locations. Um, and yeah, like I say, it's not the biggest, but I had a lot of fun exploring it and the atmosphere. Plot-wise, going to just put in a cheeky spoiler warning from now, so something's going to appear in the corner. Once that's gone, spoilers will be over. There will also be a timestamp. Now, as mentioned earlier, the plot revolves around Princess Yuki of the Saito clan calling for you to come and assist her with these strange going-ons. You're joined by another person you know, Kaede, who helps you out. And from time to time, you do get to play as her. Uh, but Samonosuke does arrive at the castle too late, just as Yuki is abducted. Whilst you're trying to locate her, you fight various demons. As mentioned, the game calls them Genma. You learn that the Genma have resurrected Nobunaga to serve them. He also, he also comes across this young orphan that Yuki took in. It's the Genma's plan to sacrifice the orphan in front of Yuki. This will create a huge amount of sorrow within her, which will purify and make her blood more potent. 
The idea is that Yuki will then be killed, Nobunaga will drink her blood and become even more powerful, which will presumably help the Genma from taking over the world. Samonosuke has been charged by the Augurs to stop them. He, along with Kaede, obviously want to put a stop to this. And it all culminates with a final encounter with the Genma leader, Fort and Brass, this giant snakey boy. Um, in a really, really cool boss fight, although I did find it quite easy because I was fully leveled up. And apparently if you do have the ultimate weapon in the game, it's even more trivial in experience. You defeat him, and it's got this really cool sequence which you don't take part in, but he proves to be a bit too powerful for Samonosuke. But Samonosuke actually turns into a kind of monster himself. Defeats Fort and Brass once and for all. But this then causes the sort of castle to fall down around him. He charges Kaede with getting Yuki and the orphan out of there. And as he himself is sort of readying to get out of there, it shows a sort of stare down between him and Nobunaga, which obviously sets up for the aforementioned sequels. So those are the spoilers over and done with. So I say without going back into spoilers, I really enjoyed the plot here. I enjoyed seeing the characters. I enjoyed meeting the different bosses. I just had a really, really good time with it. Now, rounding out this little review, I'll reiterate the production values in the game are great. Some really nicely made cutscenes. The soundtrack does not disappoint. It creates a really nice atmosphere for the game. Voice acting is generally good, especially for the time. So, let's wrap up this review with my final thoughts. I was quite excited going into this game, and it did not disappoint me. In fact, I would probably say it ended up being better than I remembered, and I'm really glad I revisited it, and cannot wait to revisit the other games in the series and finally play through the third one, which I never actually did. There are, of course, a few downsides, which are very of the time design. Fixed camera angles are always going to be a sticking point. I know many people really dislike that sort of thing. I didn't find it too bad. It didn't ruin the game for me, but your mileage may vary. I think Capcom did a good job with the framing in most situations, and it ends up being a lot better than contemporary games of the time. Uh, for some others, I can see the game's length being a bit of a sticking point. It's not a long game. If you know where you're going, it's going to be four to five hours, even if you do the side stuff. But I still think it's a very good game and well worth playing. As mentioned earlier in the game, in the video, sorry, the game has seen a HD re-release on a number of platforms, so it's thankfully accessible for most people. I know that's something that comes up a lot when I do these videos, the accessibility for others to play this. I know most people don't have access to a PS2 anymore. Um, the game, if you do have access to a PS2, I don't think the game's that expensive on the second-hand market. I got this for about £8, I think it was a few years ago, but... My go-tos will always be soft from retro games or super games world uh, physically in Middlesbrough. But you'll probably be able to find this in your local CEX as well. So if you are intrigued in playing the original version, I don't think it's that difficult or rare to get hold of. If you want to play a modernised HD remaster, it's there for you on the Switch, on Steam, on the Xbox One, on the PS4. So you can get hold of it. It is a re-release with just a nice coat of paint, some modernised controls, but not a full remake. So a number of the flaws that I had will probably still be present in the game, but it's not that expensive. I think it retails for just under £20. As of making this video, there is a Halloween sale on, but by the time this video goes out, that will probably be off, so it will probably back up to just under that £20 mark. I think Onimusha is one of those titles that definitely has a hell of a lot of charm to it, it is unique and interest. It's got a unique and interesting setting, which I don't think you see used too often. It's not dissimilar to Tenchu in that way. You know, you don't get many games that focus in on that whole samurai thing, uh, apart from maybe games like Dynasty Warriors, which are more Musou large-scale battles. So it's nice to see this be played. I would love to see a developer tackle something like this again, if not a full, you know, remake of the series or just porting the others. I had. An immensely fun time with it. The short length of it actually makes it a game that I would happily pick up and play again. So, with all of that said, thank you all so much for taking the time to watch this. It is super appreciated. If you do have any memories of this game or the series, please do let me know in the comments below. Please don't forget to like the video and subscribe to the channel for more retro gaming content. I've been having a lot of fun 
making these videos and I'm really glad to see people do enjoy them and it awakens some memories for many. So until next time, thank you very much for watching. Goodbye.